chapter 17 is a pretty short chapter. We should be able to get through it. Maybe I'll get chapter 18 up tonight as well, if not certainly uh, at some point on Monday. Uh, again, don't feel pressured to take the quiz until you have an opportunity to review the videos that are related to the material. Uh, chapter 17 is about formalities of sale. Remember, sale has to be about goods or it wouldn't be a sale. Uh, when you use the term sale, it has a legal technical quality to it. It means both goods, movable, tangible items. Uh, and this is going to deal with some of the exceptions to the statute of frauds and what needs to be put in the writing if one is in fact required. Uh, they start off with the concept about multiple purchases in statute of fraud. If I go into a, into a business and I order, it's a fairly large business, say, for example, and I order several different goods at the same sort of visit, and but I maybe deal with several different sales agents and the ultimate contract for all the goods adds up over $500. Would a requirement of the writing be enforced if I decide later I'm not going to actually come in with the money and buy them? And there's a sort of totality of circumstances analysis where am I dealing with the same sales clerk through all the different selection of the goods that I want? Then it would be a sale of goods over 500 that would require the writing to be enforceable. But if I'm dealing with different sales clerks when I'm making the different orders in a, say, a large department store, uh, then the individual sales are distinct and therefore they wouldn't be subject to the statute of frauds. And again, the statute of frauds, very important concept, is only applicable in the executory stage. So if you're selling me goods for $700, a snowball a blower, I don't know, I'm obviously fixated on snow blowing, especially when it's 100 degrees outside. It's a good. It has to be in writing to be enforceable. But if I give you the $700 and you pass over the snow blower to me so I can take it away, we don't care about the lack of writing because we both execute it. Remember, the concept is only applicable in its executory stage. So when proof of an oral contract is permitted, we already said, generally speaking, if goods over $500 are subject to the sale, it needs to be in writing to be enforceable. But do we have some exceptions to that? Yeah, one is called a receipt and acceptance. Think about it. If you're selling me goods uh, valued at over $500, say it's $5,000 worth of ball bearings that are going to come into my factory and I need to produce certain machinery. And those ball bearings come to my warehouse and my agent or myself has accepted those and we've taken dominion and control of them with a desire to do so to basically show the intent to be bound the need for a writing is now vitiated they delivered so they showed their intent i accepted i showed my uh, intent even though it might be executory in some fashion i haven't paid yet it would be binding against me because i've shown my intent to be bound by exercising dominion and control the full contract would be enforceable against me if i received all of the goods subject to the contract. But if it's partial, only the portion by which I've received and accepted would be enforceable. It's kind of common sense. It's a nice little principle. Remember what the UCC is trying to do. What is the UCC? The Uniform Commercial Code. It's trying to create rules and framework that have a fair amount of common sense and sort of business practices adopted into the law. And one of them, based upon common sense, is if I receive the goods and I've accepted them, contract should be fully enforceable against me for the portion of which I've received and accepted. It's common sense, I think, anyways. In the same with payment. What about this? I Instead of me receiving the ball bearings, I sent payment to the seller. The seller has cashed the check, put it in their bank account, and, it's, and maybe there's one of those voucher checks. Those of you who take business law too, we talk about commercial paper. Some checks have the thing called a, a, a voucher ledger on the bottom of the check that references what the check's for. And it says 5,000 ball bearings of a certain size and quality on the, on the bottom of the voucher check. They've accepted the check. Now the contract is fully enforceable against them because it's evidence of our intent to be bound. Remember what the statute of fraud is trying to do. It's trying to avoid fraud. It shows their intent to be in the agreement with, with me. Now, what about partial payment? I only paid a portion of the $5,000 towards the ball bearing. The portion of the contract that can be enforceable relates to the amount of payment given. It's graduated. It, it, it makes, I think, perfect sense. So these are exceptions to the statute of frauds. Don't need a writing if there's been receipt and acceptance for that portion of the contract. And same with that portion of the contract where payment was sent and received by the recipient and accepted as if they wanted to exercise ownership of those funds. Judicial admission, this never comes up. Uh, I'm dating myself here, although it wasn't even in my generation, but there was a show once called Perry Mason, and there was this great criminal defense attorney there. And every time during the course of the trial, somebody on the stand would break down and admit that they were the actual murderer in the case. 
it, it almost never happens. But I guess it happens. Maybe I'm not talking about murder here, but it's the sense that if I'm suing you for a contract and the defendant says on the stand, yeah, we had an agreement, but the statute of frauds required it to be in writing, and therefore I can't be held responsible for it. But yeah, you're right. We did have an agreement for $5,000 worth of ball bearings, and I was supposed to deliver a certain date, but we never reduced it to writing, so I know it can't be enforced against me. By admitting that in open court, what have we just avoided? The whole concern about fraud. You're admitting there was an agreement. It alleviates the concern that I'm lying about the existence of a contract. It almost never happens. Every so often you get a, you know, someone who's a little bit too cocky about something and they think by admitting in court they're somehow not subjecting themselves to the um, the extent of the law by admission admitting the existence of certain facts, a judicial admission. So what's one exception? Receipt and acceptance of goods. The other's part payment or full payment in the acceptance of the other side. And the next one is judicial admission. You're admitting in a court forum that the contract existed. That's as, just as good as a writing is the point the book's trying to say, the UCC created this exception. Non-resellable goods, one of my favorite topics because I not directly but indirectly experienced this in my own life. I think about these things that come up and say, geez, how can I bring them to the class? And this happened maybe, you know, it's gotta be 16, 17 years ago. There was a scuba diving shop in Lemons, uh, uh, Leicester, Massachusetts on Route 9. And this guy named Earl, used to own it he passed away and the place is um no longer a scuba diving shop unfortunately i used to hang around there quite a bit i used to like to go in and fantasize about different gear that i couldn't afford and i always remember this guy coming in who had to be six four six five in height very very tall guy he wasn't just tall he was quite large he was you know I, i'm going to be offensive but he was robust he was probably over 400 pounds a, a mountain of a human being and he was a scuba diver and those of you that know anything about that, you have to wear a certain kind of suit, either a wetsuit or a dry suit. And it's got to fit in a certain way to be functional or it's not going to work well. Earl would actually take your measurements and make a custom fit suit for you. Now, if you have sort of standard dimensions as a person and you decide not to go forward with buying that suit, it be sold to somebody else probably, right? In fact, I'll, most people, when they, including myself, when I buy, if I buy a wetsuit or a dry suit, I buy it based upon sort of standard sizing. This guy couldn't. He just, you're not going to buy something off the rack for somebody who has those kinds of dimensions. So he hired Earl to make him a custom made wetsuit. And I, I wasn't a party to it, but I'm listening. I'm just curious about it. And Earl charged him, I think, about $700, very reasonable price. And he was going to cut it out of a certain dimension neoprene. Think about it. It's a good, isn't it? Yeah. A scuba diving wetsuit is a good, it's a movable, tangible item. Is it something that should have been reduced to writing to be enforceable between the parties? Sure, it's over $700. So, and it's obviously going to be in an executory stage because the guy didn't pay any money at that moment, and nor did Earl have the suit in his stock. He had to make it. <laughs> and so, think about it. So, what if Earl sits down, and I don't know how much time it takes. He was a bit of a tailor. He, he cut the material, and he'd make it up. He makes the suit for this you know 400-plus pound guy that's 6'5 in, in height. Imagine if the buyer, I don't know who he was, I saw him around a few times before and after that too, but if he came in and says, yeah, Earl, I'm not going to go forward with it, could Earl sue him? Well, under the principles of the statute of frauds, no, he couldn't because he didn't reduce it to writing and contracts over $500 have to be in writing. But here's the exception. It's a non-resellable good. And what does that mean? It shows very unlikely scenario that the buyer must have requested the purchase of that dry suit because why else would the manufacturer have ever put that together? Now it's risky. The jury or the judge still would have to believe that the parties did in fact have to agree, but the evidence of making non-resellable goods carries a lot of, of, of clout and a lot of um, veracity and truthfulness for the court. And I always think about, you know, you can see the political buttons behind me. I've got them all over the place. Uh, I have to hide them because I have so many of them. My, my, my family is not as keen on them as I am. But I occasionally toy with the idea of running for office. Now, what if I, I, I kind of a unique name, it's not like Smith or Sullivan or, or Jones, it's Corman in it with a K. And now what if I was going to run for Worcester County Sheriff? I'm not, I'm just using this as hypothetical, actually. You know, the, the spread rumors and I know uh, Lou Evangelite as well. I'm not running against Lou. So, and I call up a political 
campaign company that sells pencils and those little nail files and hairbrushes and all kinds of little bric-a-brac with my name on it saying, you know, vote Jim Corman, Sheriff Worcester County. And let's say I ordered a bunch of pens or pencils with those terms on them. And I decided not to go forward. Say it's $5,000 worth of, you know, uh, uh, let's say pens to make it simple. You know, Jim Corman, Sheriff, Worcester County, you know, something to that effect. That's a non-resellable good. Why? There's not going to be anybody else named Jim Corman going to be running for Worcester County Sheriff. It's just, it's a non-resellable good. It's unique to that individual's needs and purposes. Would that contract now be enforceable against me, even though we were, did, didn't reduce it to writing? Well, it's a good pens or goods. Is it over $500? Yes. Why would it be enforceable against me? Because it would seem very reasonable. Judge would still have to believe it. Maybe they're con people on the other side and just basically trying to induce you to be forced into a contract. But it seems more likely I must have placed that order, right? And nowadays everything's on the internet. And that's the other thing too, by the way, reducing to writing. What does the writing have to entail? There is now an electronic uh, electronic signature law. Basically, if you hit that thing on LL Bean or some other website where you agree to the terms of the contract, that's as if that's, that's equal to a writing now. And that's good because we have to keep up with technology. Otherwise, all these internet contracts would be unenforceable, arguably, for those goods that aren't unique, right? Non resellable goods. So I kind of jumped ahead there, but the electronic, that's equal to an electronic signature on a written form. Uh, nature, and that goes to the next one, nature of the writing required. It doesn't have to be fancy. When I first got out of law school, I'm not from a, fam a group of lawyers, so I was a bit naive. And I remember there used to be paper companies out there. Staples is one, I guess, still like that. But there was a company in downtown Worcester at one time uh, across from where the current courthouse was, but that was back when the courthouse was further down the road. It was called Paulson's. And they had, I actually remember buying uh, although I went and worked for a firm, but when I first got to law school, I didn't know where I was going to work. And I thought maybe I just open up my own practice. I remember buying legal size paper. So I thought, well, if it's law and it's going to have to be on paper, it has to be on legal paper. I was very naive. I thought, like many of you probably think, it has to have a lot of fancy legal terms in a contract. Not at all. In fact, it's discouraged. The plainer, the clearer, the more specific the language, the better. Because we want to jury or a judge to be able to say, I know what Jim had to do. I know what Jane had to do in the contract. Don't make it complex. Don't make it, if it is complex, you break it down into subparts for clarity. And that's the good news. We don't want legalese in contracts. We don't want the aforesaid Smith or the, you know, we don't want all that kind of archaic language that trips people up where they have to have, you know, advanced degrees to even read through it. I want to be able to say, you know, somebody with a basic high school education can read through this with efficiency and understanding that that's the key. Because if it is confusing, this isn't in this chapter. Well, maybe it should be. If one party writes the contract and there is confusion in it, the law says that it'll be construed against the drafter because the drafter is the, usually both parties draft, they negotiate back and forth the terms, but sometimes one party drafts the contract and basically gives it to the other. Here's my offer, here's the offer of the contract, here are the terms, you either agree or don't agree. We will construe ambiguous and confusing language against the drafter of the document. And that seems only fair because you're the one drafting it. So what's my advice to you? Don't worry about always hiring lawyers to draw up your legal contracts. Draw them up as clearly and as detailed, but without going crazy, you don't need a ton of detail. The core terms, so we know what both parties are applied to. And usually you do want price in there as well, but again, sometimes price is implied. Hey, default to thinking it should be in there. The course should have some common sense applicability for you for understanding. And if you can throw it in, um, certainly throw in price because I think later someone can make a strong argument. We never really had a mutual meeting of the minds because we never negotiated price and that was critical to our bargaining. Um, signature. This trips people up a lot. I, I do often put one test question on the exam. Both parties don't have to sign. And I know that defies common sense, but think about it. If you and I have a contract, you're selling me that snowblower. I'm buying the snowblower. It's a thousand dollars. We're going to have an executory stage, so we better put it in writing to make it enforceable. I write up the contract. I'm the buyer. I sign it. I send it over to you. You never sign it. And I find out you didn't sign it. All of a sudden, the last thing, I don't really want to. I've got seven kids. They should be able to uh, shovel. They don't, but they could. And so, 
So I got the seven kids. I'm going to start banking on them to contribute to the snow shoveling. And I decide not to go forward with the contract. Is it enforceable against me? Could I argue that the seller never signed the contract and therefore the written contract's invalid? No. Because they're willing to go forward, we don't need their signature. In fact, they could sign it right now after a dispute develops. We don't care about when the contract comes into existence as long as it's time, the time before trial. You can sign it right on the courthouse steps. Say, here, now, now I got my signature on it. What's the big deal? So what's the standard? We only need the signature of the party that's resisting going forward. If the party's willing to go forward, we don't have to worry about their signature because they're admitting the existence of the contract. I think that makes sense, right? At first blush, it sounds like, oh no, both parties have to sign to be a valid contract. Both parties should sign it, no doubt. But the one that we really have to have sign is the one that's saying, I don't want to go forward. <clears throat> because the one that's willing to go forward can sign it right in that moment, or by their admission, judicial admission, that's good enough too. <clears throat> so it's a bit of a, I think, a technical trick question. Everyone always says, oh, both parties have to sign. In, in a live class, we talk about that quite a bit. I shouldn't say a live class, but in traditional class, brick and mortar, we do some, you know, do you have to sign? Do I have to sign? Everyone says both. The seller has to sign. The buyer has to sign. Everyone disagrees. Because it's not the buyer or the seller. It's not both. It's the party resisting enforcement that we need their John Hancock on the document because the other party is willing to go forward. We're not worried about them being duped into being forced into a contract they don't want to be in. They're trying to enforce it. So we're not worried about their signature. Um, and again, no special paper it has to be on. It can be on a there has been some famous case law. If you really go to law school, you might, you never know, you might get the bog. I did. I'm actually wearing my Springfield Technical Community College t-shirt, the place I graduated from, the sister institution of the law. Um, you know, that's where I got the bog and thought, hey, this is way beyond me. But, you know, eventually the term started understanding, becoming more understandable to me, the vocabulary and things. Um, but, you know, when you go to law school and you study this stuff in a great deal more detail, there's always uh, the fun cases where people literally had a contract written up on a, a bar napkin. Um, another one's on, I think, a pillowcase, but that's a will, but it's related to the show intent. And somebody wrote a, uh, a will out on a, uh, a pillowcase on their deathbed. Um, questions like that come up quite a bit. And the important thing to note is we don't care so much about the writing. It should be in pen. It's nice if it's tight because, you know, I know my handwriting is atrocious and we don't want to leave ambiguity. And I'm a terrible speller also. So the nice thing about putting things in a typewritten form with spell check, it alleviates some of that, those errors. And when you are writing it out in a typewritten form, you do tend to be a little more reflective about the language and the clarity of what you're doing. But again, nothing fancy. And when's the time of the writing? When does it have to be ex executed? Any time before you seek enforcement or go to court, you want it to be reduced to writing. The sooner the better. Um, but don't worry about the time of the writing. You know, oh, you know, uh, the contract, we didn't sign it for a whole week after it was written up. Uh, it's not enforceable now. No, it's fully enforceable. That's not a problem. In particular writings, generally speaking, usually there has to be no ma magic language. Um, these are things like formal contracts, bills of sales, letters, emails. Emails are a form of written uh, document now because the law has said so. Um, Things like cash register receipts, tickets, movie invoices, those usually are not enough, but the combination of them sometimes add up enough to the right, you know, because if you have enough pieces of writing incorporating the same uh, thing, that would be considered enough. And there's also this concept that if we have a very brief writing, but it refers to a written memorandum, either attached or located somewhere else, then it becomes incorporated. And it's as if that writing is right there too. It's called uh, incorporation by reference. I do that sometimes when I write wills. I'm writing my buddy's will and he's got a bunch of specific things he wants to go to specific people and I don't either have the time or don't want to know who he's giving everything away to. So he, I put in there, there may be a written memorandum about personal property being devised by the decedent and that will be incorporated herein as if it's part of the will. You can do the same thing with contracts. That's pretty much it for chapter 17, not the lengthiest chapter. It almost probably could have been combined with chapter 18, which is where transfer of title and risk of loss. Bit of a boring chapter, really important because we want to know who owns the goods. And if something happens to them at some point along the way before the completion of the contract, who's going to bear the risk of loss and can you get insurance and things like that. So I'll try to potentially get that done, uh, if not today, uh, tomorrow. Otherwise, try to uh, enjoy the very, very hot weekend. Be well.